Safe are in listen only mode. Good evening and welcome to How Does IBD Happening? Happen? Understanding the Immune System, a webinar presented by the Northwest Chapter of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Uh, my name is James Lord and I'll be your presenter tonight. Um, it says here I am a gastroenterologist at Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle and a researcher at the Benaroya Research Institute, uh, which is where we are broadcasting from tonight. And I am a CCFA Northwest Chapter Medical Advisory Committee member and a member of the CCFA Northwest uh, Board of Directors and Mission Committee. So quite happy to be involved with our local chapter of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation where our mission is to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and to improve the quality of life for children and adults affected by these diseases. The CCFA works to achieve the two parts of this mission through funding research and education and support programs to help people living with Crohn's and colitis. Uh, check out ccfa.org to find a reliable disease information and for upcoming events and opportunities to get involved with your local chapter. Now this happens to be uh, Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Week, December 1st through 7th. You can help spread awareness by posting on your social media pages using the hashtag IBDSelfie. See other people's posts and learn more about Awareness Weeks at uh, ccfa.org slash someone you know, all one word. Uh, Take Steps is a community event that brings together patients, family and friends and healthcare providers, raise funds and awareness. Uh, find the walk in your community at uh, ccfatakesteps.org. And for those of you looking for more of a workout, um, Team Challenge is an endurance training program that provides professional coaching and a supportive team to help you train for an endurance event, run, walk, cycle, triathlon, while you fundraise for cures to Crohn's and colitis. Learn more at uh, ccteamchallenge.org. And uh, I did this a couple of years ago, and I've got to tell you, it was a really um, inspirational event. If you have a question during the program, please type it into the question box on your control panel on the right side of your screen. After the pres presentation, I'll read the questions out loud and answer the ones that I can for everyone to hear. Uh, we'll be recording this presentation. We'll email out the replay link to all registrants once it is ready. Um, I will caution you that uh, there, some people have already sent in questions uh, during registration, and some of these questions are so good, I'm really going to be challenged to try and answer them. Um, but I will do my best. So now on to the presentation. Uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about how does IBD happen, understanding the immune system. And this is a uh, talk near and dear to my heart because uh, I am both a, a practicing gastroenterologist treating IBD patients, but I also work in this research institution um, studying the immune system um, that I got my PhD in. And so tonight I want to talk about the immune system in general and give everyone kind of a broad background on what the immune system is and then go into some fine detail in terms of how the immune system is really put together and hopefully make some sense out of what's, what's probably kind of a mysterious organ for most people. I'd also like to talk specifically about the gastrointestinal immune system and why I think that this is a particularly fascinating area of immunology and a really important area to understand. And it's obviously of important to, importance to inflammatory bowel disease. And so I'll work in the relevance to IBD throughout the talk and also try and speak specifically about what we know about some aspects of uh, immunology in uh, IBD towards the end of the talk. So what is the immune system? Where is it? I mean, when you talk about the gastrointestinal tract, it's easy to point to some specific organs like the colon or the stomach and say, there it is, that's, that's the GI tract. But the immune system is a little more nebulous because it's really spread throughout your entire body. These are some of the, uh, the areas that are enriched for immune uh, cells, such as your lymph nodes. Uh, the, the intestines themselves, in particular, these things called Peyer's patches, are fairly enriched for uh, immune cells, but they're really in your bloodstream and throughout your entire body, so there isn't really one immune organ. So why do we have an immune system? Well, these are immune cells. Um, they just look on a slide, kind of like little blue dots when you stain for their DNA. But uh, the immune system you can think of as sort of your body's defending army. Uh, its job is to protect you from all the various germs and microbes that are out there in the world trying to infect and overrun uh, a warm body. And it's made out of lots of different types of cells. Um, it starts out in your bone marrow through a process called hematopoiesis, 
These cells turn into many, many different types of cells as they grow up and mature and do a process called differentiation where they become more and more refined and specific in terms of their function. And they end up falling into a couple of very well-defined job descriptions that you can think of sort of like the jobs in, in an actual functioning army where some of them are like the enlisted soldiers and others have more of a decision-making managerial capacity like the officers of the army. And uh, consequently, the cells of your immune system are highly specialized, like different kinds of solar, uh, soldiers. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the audience has played the game Stratego before, um, but there's a distinct hierarchy and ranking to um, the, the different uh, player pieces in that game and, and uh, drawn along the lines of an army. And uh, one can sort of make the analogy that your immune system cells fall into a similar hierarchy where certain cells govern other cells which ultimately govern, govern cells that interact directly with the germs that can invade us and play specific roles defending us against different types of infections. So I'll go through these one by one and this is going to rapidly get a little bit technical but I'll try and, and not indulge myself too much in the details. I put at the top of the army the dendritic cell is sort of the, the general of the army. Um, we call these professional antigen presenting cells uh, because their job is to sample uh, what we call antigens, which are potentially foreign molecules in your environment. Anything that is potentially seen by your immune system as foreign we call an antigen, just to, to put it all into one word. And what they'll do with these antigens is chew them up and present little pieces of them called peptides on, the, on their surface for other immune cells to detect. At the same time, they can detect danger signals from nearby germs uh, through these special receptors called TLRs uh, on their surface. Don't ask where the name comes from. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then they direct the immune system through receptors on their own surface, which will provide contact-dependent signals to nearby cells, but they also put out these hormones called cytokines that tell the immune system uh, what to do. And this is just a picture of how a dendritic cell or an antigen presenting cell can gobble up a foreign germ or microbe like this, ingest it, tear it up into little pieces, and then present one of these pieces on what's called an MHC molecule. It's a receptor on its surface that presents this piece of something foreign for another immune cell to interact with. And the main cells that interact with these molecules are what we call T cells. T cells recognize only the peptides presented by these antigen presenting cells uh, through what they, call, what they have called a T cell receptor. And what's interesting about T cells is whereas most of the cells in your body all have the exact same DNA, the same genetics, every T cell in your body actually has its own unique T cell receptor. Um, so they randomly rearrange the part of their DNA so that they will be the only cell in your body that makes this one particular T cell receptor. And so when you have billions of different T cells floating around your bloodstream, and they're all different from each other, that means that your immune system can protect, potentially recognize billions of different foreign things as foreign. And this is how it actually can uh, develop memory and uh, be able to discern foreign from, from safe things that it does not want to react to. And this is an interaction, this is a, a cartoon of how the T cell interacts with this antigen presenting cell. Um, the unique T cell receptor here in blue binds this unique antigen peptide in green presented on this red molecule. Um, and that triggers a set of signals inside the T cell which causes the cell to react by maturing, proliferating, and performing its various functions to drive an inflammatory response. And one of the targets of uh, steroids like prednisone is uh, NF-kappa B here with the red X through it. Um, and so part of what prednisone does, if you're wondering how some of the medications we use to treat IBD work, uh, this is one of the major targets of prednisone is to block a, an important part of the signal from functioning in the T cell. Now T cells themselves can be further divided up in, and the main way they've been divided up into are CD4 and CD8 cells, more colloquially known as helpers and killers. And the helper cells recognize foreign antigens that are presented through these professional presenting cells and then they make hormones called cytokines and they also express co-receptors just like the, those dendritic cells and those direct the immune system in terms of what to do. So the CD4s act more like a manager, more like an officer. The CD8s, when they recognize the antigen, which can be presented by any cell in the body, they will actually react by killing the cell they recognize. So the main role of, a, of something like a, a CD8 cell is actually to kill off cancer cells and cells that are infected with something like a virus that lives inside them. 
So most of our research is actually, well, actually, I, I shouldn't say most of our research. Most of, um, oh, there's a lot of research that's been done on CD4 positive cells, be, in part because these cells are so common. They outnumber the killers by about two to one, and there have been several subtypes described. Um, the ones that have never seen something foreign before we call naive, just like a person who's never really been out in the world experience anything, uh, these cells start out as naive where they're really undifferentiated. They don't really have a characteristic. They haven't been told to grow up and, and take on a particular profession. Um, and not surprisingly, when you're born, most of your T cells are naive. And by the time you're in your 60s, only a small percent of your T cells will still be naive. So just like your, your brain becomes more and more experienced over the course of your lifetime, your immune system also becomes less and less naive, more and more experienced as you get older. And so these experienced cells we call effector cells, and they can be divided into several different types based upon the types of those cytokine hormones that they produce. So there are what are called Th1 or T helper type 1 cells, which uh, help fight germs that live inside human cells like viruses. There are Th2s, which help fight worms and parasites. And there are Th17s, uh, they skipped a few numbers here and jump all the way up to 17, and these seem to be important for fighting bacteria. And so in the Th1 cells will make cytokines, uh, these hormones called interferon and TNF, that tell uh, the various killer cells, natural killer cells, and also those CD8 killer T cells I mentioned, to kill off cells that contain viruses, whereas the Th2 cells cause things like eosinophils and mast cells that make all the histamine that make you itchy when you, when you have a bad rash. These help kill worms and parasites through uh, their own set of hormones. And then the Th17s have yet another set of hormones that bring in the neutrophils, the most uh, common cells in your immune system, basically the foot soldiers of your immune system, not unlike the scouts in Stratego, to kill off the bacteria that uh, could potentially infect you. <laughs> now, some of you may recognize this one hormone here, TNF-alpha, because this has become a major target for um, inflammatory diseases because as you can see here, sometimes when your immune system, instead of uh, attacking foreign things as wrong, it will actually attack your own body. And depending on the type of immune response you get, you can get different types of inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this is eczema or atopic dermatitis. And uh, this is Crohn's disease seen through a colonoscope. And these can be mediated by different branches of the immune system. But common to the ones that cause autoimmunity are this TNF uh, hormone. And so some of the drugs we use specifically block just this hormone. Um, these are drugs like infliximab, adalimumab, sertilizumab, or golimumab that some of you may recognize. And so these drugs specifically block the pro-inflammatory function of Th1 and Th17 cells while sparing this uh, Th2 type response. So immunity is a balance between immunoregulation and inflammation. If you get too much immunoregulation, you're vulnerable to infection. You, it's like trying to suppress the army in a particular country. If you completely get rid of all military and police, then you have absolute chaos. On the other hand, if you have too much inflammation, then you have the problem that the, the police start um, uh, overreacting to, to the, the public at large. You get inflammation in, in a body if the immune system is hyperactive and it's under-regulated. And so you get a condition called autoimmunity, where the immune army attacks its own host. This is not unlike a civil war, where you have an army attacking its own citizens. And there are many, many different forms of autoimmunity, depending on which organs the immune system uh, randomly starts attacking. And these include the inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So there are many safety checks that exist to try and regulate the immune system. For example, when we develop um, self-reactive cells, cells that would turn on us and, um, and react against our own body, the immune system has organs like the thymus where some of these cells can actually be deleted, so you specifically select and destroy the cells that could cause the most harm. There are also special molecules your immune system uses to turn down an immune response, receptors like CTLA-4 shown here, or uh, some of those immune hormone cytokines like IL-10 that can turn off an immune response. And finally, there are cells that act kind of like the military police in your, in your immune army to try and control any sort of um, inappropriate activity of your immune system attacking your own body. 
And one of the most important ones of these that's come to light recently is the regulatory T cell. Uh, these are critical regulators of the immune system. They are CD4 positive T cells, remember, so they fit in that helper T cell class I mentioned. And like any T cell, uh, or I'm sorry, they're a minority of your, your total T cell population. So most of your T cells are not regulatory T cells. Now, remember when an antigen presenting cell shows up and presents antigen to a T cell, normally what it will do is stimulate inflammation by secreting those special signals like cytokines and hormones that cause other cells to activate, but also these cells will divide and make clones of themselves to become much more uh, populous and, and amplify the immune reaction. Well, what a regulatory T cell does when it sees antigen is to actually come in contact with the what we call the effector cells, the cells that are driving inflammation, and it specifically blocks their ability to proliferate and make those pro-inflammatory signals. Now, my, there have been a variety of mouse models that suggest that Tregs are critical for controlling IBD, and I won't go into the details, but there have been several different models in which regulatory T cells are disrupted in mice, and the mice get uh, autoimmunity and bowel inflammation resembling human inflammatory bowel disease. But of course, animal models are necessarily just a model. However, there is also a um, condition that occurs in uh, some families where they bear a gene with a mutation in the, something called FOXP3. This is a gene that's absolutely central to the development of these regulatory T cells. So if people are born without it, they end up developing really severe autoimmunity of multiple organs, and in particular, the gastrointestinal tract shown here where you see lots of immune cells invading. This is just a, a microscopic section of, of a small bowel where the lining of the bowel has been effectively destroyed by the immune attack on it. And many of these patients, unfortunately, would, would die if we did not have stem cell transplants with which to replace their immune system. However, inflammatory bowel disease is not IPEX. Um, this is data from our own lab um, showing that uh, there are uh, just as many, if not more, regulatory T cells in both the bowel and the blood of patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease when compared to people who don't have IBD. So there's something wrong that's limiting the ability of these regulatory T cells to work in IBD, but we don't know what it is. So I'm going to skip over to the, the, the last immune cell population I'm going to talk about is the B cells. Um, B cells recognize an intact antigen as opposed to just the, the peptide fragment like the T cells do. The B cells can actually bind to the whole thing. You can actually have a B cell that will recognize an intact virus. Um, and they use what's called an antibody or a B cell receptor on, um, that uh, is unique to the B cell, much like a T cell has its own unique T cell receptor. Every B cell randomly recreates its own B cell, and so all the billions of B cells in your body all have different um, specificities. Now they start out only expressing their antibodies on the surface, but then as they mature with the help from a CD4 T cell, a B cell can turn into something called a plasma cell, which uh, secretes lots and lots of soluble antibodies. And so when you check somebody's bloodstream, the serum, the plasma, where they see uh, these antibodies is uh, chock full of these uh, antibodies simply because the plasma cells are such effective antibody factories. And this is a cartoon description of, of how this process happens. So when a B cell encounters its matching antigen, so it finds something foreign that its surface receptor can bind to, it'll pull it inside itself, chew it up, and then present a little piece of it on the surface of the B cell. And then one of these helper T cells comes along, recognizes it through its T cell receptor, makes the hormones that, the, that are needed to tell the B cell to grow up, and it uses a a receptor called CD40 to, to tell the B cell, okay, now you can grow up into a plasma cell. And then once it turns into a plasma cell, it starts pumping out all of these soluble antibodies. These little blue Y looking things are soluble antibodies that float around in your circulation and help protect you from viruses. However, this exact same process can cause a problem in patients who are taking these biopharmaceutical drugs like infliximab, sertilizumab, uh, adalimumab, all of the um, the so-called biologic drugs are actually foreign proteins that we're putting into your body, and that's exactly what your immune system is good at recognizing and, and eliminating. And so just like a piece of a virus can be recognized and internalized by a B cell, this drug can be brought into a B cell, chewed up, presented on, on a cell, helped by a T cell, and then you can have these B cells that are pumping out lots and lots of soluble antibodies that can interfere with the ability of these biological drugs 
uh, to uh, help control your inflammatory bowel disease because first of all they will clear the drug much more quickly so your blood levels will get really low and secondly they can actually stimulate an allergic reaction which can compromise the safety of these drugs so immune reactions to biologics are really the Achilles heels of the uh, the drugs in this class uh, there is a way that we can reduce the likelihood that you'll have problems with these antibodies um, and the main one that's that uh, has been validated is using drugs in a class called thiopurine this includes the azathioprine drug Imuran, the 6-mercaptopurine or 6-MP drug Purinethal. Um, and you can see in a couple of very large clinical trials, uh, for Crohn's it was called Sonic, for ulcerative colitis it was called Success, that uh, patients who got either infliximab alone or infliximab with azathioprine, the rates of antibody formation were dramatically lower in the patients who uh, were co-administered azathioprine. So there was about a 15% drop in antibody formation and surprisingly enough using these two drugs together is about 15% more effective than using them alone. So I think that uh, probably the main way that these drugs help when they're used alongside a drug like infliximab is by preventing an immune reaction to the drug itself. Um, and this is some more work that just came out last week in my lab. Um, that shows that when people are on these drugs, these thiopurine drugs, uh, they have considerably fewer B cells circulating in their bloodstream than patients on no thiopurine. Remember, B cells are where antibodies come from, so perhaps it's this reduction in your B cells that's uh, causing the body to tolerate the uh, biologic drugs like infliximab so much better when people are using thiopurines at the same time. So, Another way to look at the immune system as sort of a summary is that it can be divided up into what we call the innate and the adaptive immune system. And tonight I've mostly talked about the adaptive immune system. This includes your T and B cells. Uh, interestingly, this form of the immune system is present only in vertebrates. Worms don't have T and B cells. Lobsters don't have T and B cells. Um, and it relies on random chance and selection but it's able to learn from its environment and it retains a memory of prior exposures and that's why vaccines work in people. If you give somebody a vaccine now, six months from now, they probably still will mount what we call an amnestic response where they'll, they'll be able to briskly mount a strong immune reaction to protect them from a virus in the future. This wouldn't work in a lobster. You can't vaccinate lobsters. Lobsters only have an innate immune system, which is the rest of your immune cells. Um, they are present in nearly all animals and there's actually a primitive version of them in plants, but they're fixed and non-random, so they can't really adapt, hence the name, and they have no memory of prior exposures. So <clears throat> your immune system in reality is a complex interplay between these two arms of the immune system that's happening all the time. But now I'm going to change subjects and uh, start talking about the gastrointestinal tract, the other job I have. Now the gut is an interesting organ and it's hard to think of uh, a, an animal that doesn't have at least some form of a gastrointestinal tract because unlike plants, animals all thrive upon the ability to bring nutrients in from their environment. So the gut is the portal through which nutrients enter into your body. It's an absolutely necessary part of, uh, of your physiology. However, at the same time, the gut's a barrier against the outside world. So like a castle wall, it has to protect you. It has its gate to let the outside world in, but it also has to protect you from all these potential pathogens out here, um, not orcs, but um, bacteria that uh, could potentially get inside your body and cause a major infection. So outside the wall, there are viruses, there are parasites, but in the GI tract, most importantly, there are 100 trillion bacteria, almost 10 bacterial cells in your gut for every human cell in your body. And this, com this includes not only the bad bacteria that we call pathogens, but also good bacteria called symbionts that actually are necessary for the digestive process. And additionally, outside the wall of the gut is a bunch of foreign material that we're deliberately ingesting as a source of nutrition. Certainly your immune system wouldn't have encountered chicken protein floating around in your bloodstream, uh, but it uh, has to be able to tolerate that in the form of food when you eat a chicken sandwich. Now, on the other side of the wall, there's a rich blood supply, a bunch of uh, channels called lymphatics through which the immune system traffics, and then many, many immune cells. In fact, the gut is the largest collection of immune cells in the human body, outnumbering total cell count of, of all other immune cell uh, compartments combined. 
Now, these two diametrically opposed forces, the immune system and the dirtiest place in the universe, are separated by this one wall. So what is the wall itself? Well, it's got a surface area of about 100 square meters. That's roughly the size of a tennis court. And yet it is lined by a, a, layer, a single layer of cells. The, the entire width of the wall is one layer of cells. It's incredibly thin. And um, much like a castle wall uh, where uh, it, there's an outside and an inside and a uh, military encampment, um, the gut mucosa, likewise, here's that one layer of cells that separates the outside from the inside. And on the inside of the wall, this is called the lamina propria. It's this connective tissue that's loaded with all these little blue dots are your immune system. And they come in these clusters called lymphoid follicles where they hang out sort of like an army barracks. And not only is there a lot of uh, physical proximity between the immune system and the bacteria of the gut, but the immune system actively samples the gut all the time. Y your dendritic cells will literally put these little processes called dendrites out between the, the cells of the wall, called the epithelium, and sample the bacteria that are out there uh, in what we call the lumen. Um, and then that way they can actually see and sense what's going on in the gut. Um, and if th the second way that they can have it presented is that specialized cells in the epithelium called M cells will ingest foreign particles and bring them across into where the immune system can sense them inside what's called the lamina propria, the inside of the wall. And here's another cartoon depiction of this. Um, these are the epithelial cells that line the wall. This is out where uh, all the food would be and the foreign antigens and bacteria. And here's an M cell that will bring some antigen in and present it to a dendritic cell, or the dendritic cell can just sample them directly through the wall. When the dendritic cell encounters this foreign material, it can either present it locally to immune cells that are right nearby it in the, uh, this is basically an immune follicle under the wall, that army barracks I was talking about, or it can travel through what are called lymphatics back to a lymph node. A lymph node is sort of like the headquarters for your immune system. And here the dendritic cell will interact with, remember I mentioned those naive T cells, T cells who've never seen something foreign before. This is where they learn. This is school for your immune cells. The CD4 cells will encounter the dendritic cells here, learn what they're going to grow up to be as, uh, as in terms of a job description, and then they leave the lymph node, circle back through the circulation, and come all the way back to the gut to start the inflammatory process and act as the lieutenants of the immune system driving the whole inflammatory process on a local level. And this circulatory pattern where the immune cells leave and come back and recirculate has actually recently become a target for therapy. Um, there are new uh, drugs available for treating inflammatory bowel disease which are called anti-integrant therapies. These block immune cell trafficking to the gut. And the two that have received FDA approval are Tysabri for Crohn's disease, and, um, also known as natalizumab, or Intivio, also known as Vetalizumab, which has been approved for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And these work by blocking a molecule called alpha-4 beta-7, or an integrin, on the surface of the circulating lymphocyte, shown here in pink, uh, from binding to its receptor on the blood vessels in the bowel. And the receptor is called MADCAM1. And so the antibodies basically gum up these receptors like mud on Velcro, keeping it from sticking to this MADCAM molecule. So as these cells go zipping through the bloodstream, they have no way to latch on and climb out through the wall of the blood vessel to set up an inflammatory response. And so it's sort of like closing the on-ramps on I-5. You just, they can't get to work anymore. Um, <clears throat> so getting back to the gut immunology in general, um, the mucosal immune system of the gut has a tough job. It's got to be able to discriminate between things it wants to attack, like viruses, parasites, and dangerous bacteria, and those things that it really has to ignore, like food, helpful bacteria, and then the parts of your body that are yourself, your cells, your molecules that are made by your own genes. But what if it doesn't? Then that's probably how we end up with inflammatory bowel disease. And I probably don't need to tell the audience that inflammatory bowel disease is ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. But these are two diseases that are differentiated largely based on uh, anatomy, with ulcerative colitis starting in the anus and moving proximally, potentially involving any length of the colon from just the rectum to the entire colon, but staying in the colon, not going into the small bowel at all, and staying in the lining of the colon, not going through the wall. 
This is in contrast to Crohn's disease, which can show up pretty much anywhere in the GI tract, although it preferentially tends to occur in the last part of the small intestine called the ileum and somewhere in the colon. Um, plus, it can be patchy. It's not a contiguous distribution the way that uh, ulcerative colitis is. Furthermore, it's not limited to the wall of the bowel. It can go right through the wall and create these burrowing tunnels called fistulas that can either link two hollow organs together or can lead to the skin through the abdominal wall or around the anus is one of the more common places where fistulas can occur. And if these fistulas close off, they become abscesses, little uh, pockets of uh, inflammation and pus that can be very painful and make people quite sick. Finally, because the entire wall of the bowel gets inflamed and not just the lining, over time this can result in scar tissue which can cause narrowing called strictures that can result in bowel obstructions and require emergency surgery. So getting to the core of this talk, what causes IBD, the truth is we really don't know. But we have a host of information that tells us that it's a combination of factors that involve the genes that you were born with, the microbes and bacteria that uh, live in your gut, and then your immune system. And so it brings together the different disciplines of genetics, microbiology, and immunology to combine their respective input to try and understand how this process is actually happening. And so far, the genetics community has provided a wealth of information through what are called genome-wide association studies, where we look at tens of thousands of people and compare their genetics uh, to try and see which people who have inflammatory bowel disease have more or less of certain versions of genes than people who don't have inflammatory bowel disease. And so we have found uh, almost, well, it's over 150 genes now, closing in on 200 different genes where there's at least some greater association with either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis than, uh, than in the general population. Um, and a lot of these genes are common to both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So one of the lessons is that whatever is driving these diseases has uh, really more in common than differentiates it. Another major lesson is that a lot of these genes are central to the immune system um, or to uh, how the immune system interacts with bacteria. So many of the genes are involved in uh, how the immune system recognizes bacteria specifically in the gut. And so this lends credence to the idea that IBD is actually caused by, a dysregulated, by dysregulated interactions between the immune system and the bacteria that live in your gut that we refer to now as the microbiome. And perhaps some of the strongest proof that there is a lack of regulation or, or an aberrant overactivity of immune response to gut bacteria comes from the observation that there are specific antibodies. Remember, those molecules that are made by B cells, plasma cells, Patients with Crohn's disease make considerably more of these antibodies to uh, proteins that are made by microbes that should ordinarily live in a healthy gut than patients who do not have inflammatory bowel disease or actually than ulcerative colitis patients. So something about Crohn's clearly predisposes one to developing an immune reaction to specific antigens uh, that are made by the microbes in your gut. Um, now, the microbiome in IBD has uh, come under intense study in recent years, and it's still somewhat in its uh, birth phase because this is an extremely complex uh, ecology, um, which is very difficult to study because now we're not talking about the genome of one organism, but the genomes of thousands of different organisms. So it's thousands of genes per bacteria in thousands of different types of bacteria, making it very difficult to tease out uh, really what's happening in IBD, but we are becoming more and more sophisticated in our ability to do big science. And so far, there have been many differences observed um, between the microbiome of, of patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, uh, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and those patients who do not. But a, a major challenge with something like the microbiome is trying to differentiate cause from effect. Because, of course, if you have an inflamed gut, it's going to put strong selective pressure on the bacteria that live there. And so trying to tease out what actually um, is a result of the inflammation versus what is driving the inflammation is uh, really quite a challenge. But um, to address this question in humans, you typically need something called a, a clinical trial where you are deliberately introducing something new in, in somebody's life and seeing if it has a beneficial effect. And 
So there have been efforts to deliberately change the microbiome in IBD by what's called a fecal microbiome transplant, or FMT. This is basically putting someone else's fecal bacteria into a patient's colon. And unfortunately, so far, most of the trials uh, in adults, uh, which have been done in ulcerative colitis, have been fairly disappointing. It looks like, at least in adults, the microbiome fairly quickly returns to its pre-transplant characteristics. So it's really quite difficult to alter the uh, microbiome that a person already has. And of course, if the microbiome goes back to um, the way it was before, not surprisingly, the ulcerative colitis typically goes right back to how it was before. And then usually, you don't even see much of an improvement. Um, it's a great treatment for Clostridium difficile colitis, an infection, but so far in ulcerative colitis, it hasn't really worked very well. Now, there has been some early experience here in Seattle uh, in pediatric Crohn's disease, which may be a little bit more hopeful, but uh, it's still very early. We're talking about small, uncontrolled trials at this point. So there isn't really compelling evidence that this has been an effective therapy, but um, there's optimism that potentially uh, fecal transplant may uh, produce some, some useful uh, benefit in Crohn's disease or perhaps in children um, where perhaps the immune system is less ingrained or the microbiome is less ingrained. On the flip side, there have been efforts to change the immune system as a potential cure for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, there's something called a hematopoietic cell transplant where you basically replace the bone marrow stem cells from which all of your immune cells are made and consequently replace the entire immune system. The bulk of this research has actually been done with what are called autologous stem cell transplant where the, the stem cell donor is oneself. So you're basically taking your immune your, the precursor to your immune system out, wiping out all the immune system in your body and then putting your own immune system back in. So you get all the same genes that you were ever born with. Um, but it is sort of a reset button for your immune system because all of those B cells and T cells that randomly generate the receptors have to start over. And so far, this has shown at least okay efficacy in controlling Crohn's disease, but there has been uh, relapse associated with it. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily a cure. Now there's something also called an allogeneic transplant. This means that you're giving someone else's uh, stem cells or hematopoietic system to a patient. And so the genes that come in are completely different and aren't necessarily genes that uh, would predispose one to Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and there have been case reports, situations where patients with Crohn's disease happen to get a stem cell transplant for something like leukemia. Um, and in, in case reports, it looked like it actually created a permanent cure for Crohn's disease. But allogeneic transplants are considerably more dangerous. They're still as high as a 10% mortality associated with them. And so this would only be reasonable in the most dire of circumstances for treating Crohn's disease. Having said that, there is currently a trial underway here in Seattle, spearheaded by Dr. George McDonald um, at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And um, I wouldn't normally post patient pictures on the internet, but this actually came from the blog of this patient who uh, went back to Oslo and is now posting photographs of her experience having gone through an allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, for her severe treatment refractory Crohn's disease. And what she posted on her website was that, uh, and she, by the way, this is the only the second patient that they have determined to be um, appropriate for this therapy. Um, but she was transplanted uh, earlier this summer, June 27th. And although she is still taking an immunosuppressant, tacrolimus, to try and uh, prevent any sort of graft rejection from her transplant, uh, her Crohn's disease is doing considerably better. Some strictures and ulcers that were previously present now appear to be completely gone. Um, and so thus far, with the exception of the fact that she's having to take tacrolimus for her transplant, this does appear to have cured at least this one patient um, from whom we, we have a public documentation of her, her status months after her transplant. So uh, I'm going to wrap things up now and conclude by saying that I can't really answer the question that was set out at the stop, start of the talk. Nobody really knows how IBD happens, but most likely it's a loss of immune tolerance to the gut microbes that normally live inside your, your GI tract and are necessary and evidently uh, immovable. And this is facilitated by susceptibility genes. The people who get IBD often will have genetic predispositions, not predestiny. Most patients who have 
IBD risk genes don't get IBD, but some sort of a push in the immune system towards making it a little bit easier than everybody else for you to get IBD, and that's why it tends to run in families. We know that the immune system is important because we treat IBD with immunosuppression. Now, the therapies that permanently change the immune system may hold promise for a cure, but at this point, uh, our goals of therapy, what's really been proven in clinical trials is geared more towards um, uh, maintaining remission in chronic therapy uh, than cure. But the research is ongoing, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important to have an organization like the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America dedicated to uh, bringing us something more than a chronic treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. So thank you for attending. And um, at this point, I'm going to start looking through our questions file here and see what I can do to answer some of these questions. So let's see. On the live webinar, and, uh, and please feel free to continue writing uh, questions at this point if you uh, want to type in your questions while I'm talking. Um, but somebody, oh, somebody I know, <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight, um, asks, uh, do you foresee the development of subcategories of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis diagnoses based off patient responses to different medications resulting from different immune system phenotypes? Um, there is a lot of interest, particularly um, in the biotech community, for trying to subcategorize inflammatory bowel disease in terms of what will or won't respond to certain types of therapies. Most of these efforts actually haven't been terribly successful. We do know that patients who have lots of those different antibodies um, that I mentioned, like OMPC, CBR1, ASCA, um, patients who have a lot of different uh, serologic antibodies uh, associated with inflammatory, well, with Crohn's disease, tend to have a more severe course. They, they have a higher likelihood of ultimately needing surgery. And so that has sort of been used as a sliding scale to sort of predict what's uh, going to be important for driving inflammatory bowel disease. But there hasn't really been a great marker to say, yes, this patient will respond to an anti-TNF therapy or, or this one won't. There aren't really any markers out there, despite a lot of effort to try and define them, that, that make it easy to pick out who the people are who are going to respond to certain therapies and who aren't. Um, there's a dream to create tailored medical therapy, but uh, I don't think it's really been realized yet. Now, the one um, prominent exception to this is that uh, Steph Targan down at Cedar sinai has been talking for a couple of years now about the results of a clinical trial that Amgen conducted uh, on a drug to block that IL-17 uh, cytokine you might have noticed. Uh, when I mentioned the TH17 cells, they're actually named for the fact that they make a hormone called IL-17, and Amgen made a drug that blocks, I believe, the IL-17 receptor. It actually didn't work at all in the total population. So when they looked at all Crohn's patients, it was not a successful trial. However, when they went back and looked at genetics, there was one particular gene. Um, it's called TNS, TNF-SF15, if, you, if, you're, if you're interested. Uh, but there was this one gene that if they divided people into people who had a mutation into that, in that gene and those that didn't, and most people don't, even Crohn's patients, most of them don't, um, the few people who had that gene actually did better on this drug and the rest didn't. So it may be that there are certain genetic predispositions to inflammatory bowel disease that may have predictive merit, but so far it hasn't been clear with the TNF therapies at least that uh, that, that's very useful to try and predict who will and won't respond. Um, so far, we're largely subcategorizing Crohn's and ulcerative colitis based upon how they behave clinically, like who, um, who develops fistulas and strictures, is it limited to the rectum, does it go throughout the colon? So we, we basically just describe the disease in terms of, of how it behaves and, and what we can literally see instead of looking for what we call biomarkers to serve as a surrogate. Um, for just a physical description of the, of the disease. So the next question, uh, can a person go on and off mercaptopurine without any ill effect or do they need to stay on mercaptopurine? This is in conjunction with infliximab. Well, infliximab, so to flip it around, infliximab, it actually is hazardous to start and stop the drug, to, to take the drug, stop taking it for a while, come back a few months later and take it again. I mean, if you go more than two or three months uh, without taking any infliximab, you do start to see an increasing chance that you could develop that immune reaction I talked about where you start making antibodies to infliximab or other biologics like adalimumab or, or uh, sertilizumab. Um, 
That's not true for a drug like mercaptopurine or azathioprine. These are small organic molecules. They're not proteins. And so the immune system actually does not do a very good job of, of attacking and destroying them. So you don't really have to worry about them causing an immune reaction the way you do with the biologic drugs. Um, so I would say that the only hazard there is to stopping and starting drugs like uh, azathioprine and 6-MP is that they are very slow. Uh, it can take a couple of weeks for them to wash out of your system, and it generally takes about three or four months for them to build up in your system again to the point where they're going to actually be useful. So if you really need that drug and you stop it and you find out the hard way that you shouldn't have done that, it's going to be three or four months before you see them working again, um, and you'll probably need some prednisone in the meantime to try and hold you over, and prednisone is fraught with lots of toxicity. So I would say the main downside to uh, stopping a drug like like six mercaptopurine is um, that you're probably you run the risk of a flare and consequently the risk of being put on prednisone. So uh, there's another question that says IBD presents itself very minimally in third world societies where the immune system is asked to deal with a much less sterile environment. What does this information suggest in terms of your definition of IBD as a loss of immune tolerance to normal gut biome? Well, I like to say, and this is what we call the hygiene hypothesis, that uh, it, it reminds me of the saying, idle hands are the devil's playthings, that um, it's sort of like if the immune system has nothing better to do, it starts to attack your own body for want of having a worthy opponent to fight. Um, I don't know, maybe this works into that, that military analogy I was making, but probably on a more material level, it gets back to this slide where... I was talking about the different types of microbes that your T cells can respond to. And remember that there's a subclass uh, called a Th2 cell, which um, is, here we are. So the Th2 cell is the one cell I showed that does not actually have anything to do with autoimmunity. It does promote allergy and atopic conditions like asthma. Um, but uh, it is uh, an immune response that's markedly heightened when you're infected with a parasite or a worm, what we call a helminth. Um, and worm infections in developed countries have become extremely rare, but they're still profoundly common in developing worlds. Uh, so it may be less to do with just how dirty it is in general and more to do with how uh, common worm infest infestations are in a particular environment. And there actually is an NIH-funded trial right now to uh, put patients with ulcerative colitis on pig whipworm, literally to take patients who are uh, on no immunosuppressant medication and have active left-sided ulcerative colitis and give them a, uh, uh, it's not a real infection because the natural host of, the, this, of Trichuris is a uh, pig, not a human, so it only, it only stays there for about a week. Um, but in developing an immune-mediated clearance of this, this whipworm, we think that we're retraining the immune system away from these Th1 and Th17 type responses and favoring a Th2 response, which is not going to be an effective way for immune system to uh, drive autoimmunity like an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so this is a trial that's currently enrolling, uh, funded through the NIH, um, so your tax dollars at work. And um, we uh, are enrolling right now at, at the Virginia Mason Gastroenterology Center, and um, you can certainly contact us if you'd like more information. But it's specifically for patients with ulcerative colitis uh, with disease limited to the left side of the colon. Um, and there has actually been some uh, preclinical or some earlier data that suggested that this was an effective therapy. So. Let's see, here's another question. Why do some Crohn's patients stay in remission without biologics and some can't? That's a very complicated question. Um, there can be a whole host of explanations for that. Sometimes the, the symptoms that keep them out of remission are not caused by the immune system. If you have a stricture, um, that's something that uh, it, your immune system did a long time ago, but now it's a fixed piece of scar tissue that suppressing the immune system won't help. And so for that, you typically need a mechanical intervention like a a scope to go in and pop it open with a balloon or, or surgery to uh, remove the stricture. Um, sometimes it's because the inflammation does not involve the target of TNF, or so the target of infliximab. So, so the biologics, the vast majority of biologics we're currently using target TNF-alpha, and so if your immune system 
either doesn't need TNF-alpha to cause Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, or it has lost its dependence on TNF over time and exposure to these drugs, then it may be that there is a TNF-independent inflammatory process that is causing inflammatory bowel disease, at which point those drugs are completely useless. Also, it's possible that you can have, um, like I mentioned, um, uh, where is it here? I mentioned that you can develop antibodies to these, here it is, you can sometimes get antibodies to the drugs that can interfere with your ability to um, uh, maintain high enough levels of the drug in your bloodstream to fight the inflammatory process, or sometimes these antibodies will literally block the business end of the drug so that it can't interact with TNF. So sometimes it's the immune system itself that is interfering with response to uh, TNFs. Um, Somebody asked, what causes the triggers for this disease to occur at three years of age or at any age? Well, um, I'm not a pediatrician, so I have to, I have to uh, give the disclaimer that I'm not a master of, of early onset inflammatory bowel disease necessarily, but um, there have been uh, clearly some certain genes that occur in very young patients with inflammatory bowel disease that seem to interfere with the regulation of the immune system much more than others. So some people, for example, let's see if it's on here, uh, children who are born with a defect in the receptor for IL-10 right here develop a very severe form of Crohn's disease that occurs very early in age. Um, this, so sometimes the genes that we're born with make it just so much easier for the immune system to lose control that it, it happens really early in life. Uh, whereas other people who may have uh, either less severe genetic issues or have fewer uh, genetic predispositions for inflammatory bowel disease uh, may go much later into life before something triggers the immune system to slip up and lose regulation in the gut and start to attack. This is my best guess for what really differentiates early onset inflammatory bowel disease uh, from what happens later in life, but that probably only explains the, uh, a few of the patients and some of the more severe cases. Uh, in many situations it may simply be uh, some random events such as an environmental exposure or maybe a subclinical infection that simply triggers the wrong T cell at the wrong time to set off an immune response that normally should have been shut down. Um, let's see, there were a couple of people who asked kind of about recommendations for weaning off of immunosuppressive medications once one is in remission. And this is something that comes up a lot in clinic. It's, it's really not that closely related to what we're talking about today, but um, it is a very important topic. We talked about um, a lot of different uh, therapies for inflammatory bowel disease, but really the mainstay of therapy, um, particularly for Crohn's disease, now appears to be using two drugs together, the biologic and the immunomodulator like azathioprine at the same time. So. So for example, infliximab and azathioprine at the same time has really become the mainstay of therapy in part to prevent this immunoreactivity that tends to occur when you use the biologic alone. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, if you're started on two drugs, do you really have to stay on two drugs forever? There were two major studies that really addressed this question from different directions. So the earlier of these was written by a guy named Van Ash um, at least half a decade ago. And he took a bunch of patients who were on um, azathioprine and infliximab and randomized them. They'd, they'd all been in deep remission, just totally asymptomatic with no signs of inflammation for at least six months before randomization. And then he split the group in half. Half of them he just left them on two drugs, said keep taking these drugs. The other half he swapped out their azathioprine for a placebo and he watched them for another two years. And what he saw was that the rates of relapse was a, were exactly the same between the two populations. So the people who took two drugs had just as high a likelihood of failing their, their infliximab as the patients who were on infliximab by itself. Now one difference is that the patients who were just on infliximab did have a higher inflammatory marker called C-reactive protein, which may mean that if they'd watched them for another year or two, they would have seen a difference between those populations, but at least during the first two years, the length of the study, it did not appear that, that uh, azathioprine was, was really all that critical once they'd been in deep remission on infliximab for at least six months, and in many cases more than 12 months. Um, my guess is what happens is that over time 
your immune system gets tolerized to the infliximab being in your body. So maybe at first it recognizes it as foreign, and maybe at first you can block your B cells with, with azathioprine from causing this immune reaction. But once the drug has been sitting around in your body for six or 12 months, your body starts to think of it as family. It, it just doesn't recognize it as being a foreign thing anymore. And so you no longer need the uh, azathioprine to um, reduce your B cell count and, um, and prevent you from mount mounting an immune reaction to the drug. Now the flip side of this was a trial called STORI, S-T-O-R-I, uh, which was done in Europe. And in this, it wasn't randomized. Everybody got treated the same way. And so they took a bunch of patients who had now been in stable remission for a year on dual therapy, and they stopped the anti-TNF. And then they kept watching those patients for another three years. And what they saw was about half the patients uh, had a relapse within that three-year period, usually sometime in the first year. So the majority of the relapses were all in the first of those three years. But over the course of three years, is almost exactly half of the patients um, had at least some breakthrough flare in their IBD. So I guess this is sort of a glass half empty, half full situation. You Either the patients um, really got, uh, uh, half of the patients didn't need a thiopurine or half of the patients uh, should never have stopped it in the first place. But the good news was that in that half that relapsed, they were able to restart Remicade in pretty much everybody. Um, there was essentially no development of antibodies to it, provided the patients continued on the azathioprine by itself. So it is rolling the dice. Um, it's a flip of the coin, uh, I guess more than a roll of the dice, as to whether you uh, uh, will ultimately need dual therapy or not in that situation. But as long as you keep taking the immunomodulator, it looks like uh, your, your uh, long-term response, uh, your ability to, to, to restart the infliximab is not compromised. Uh, looks like a few more questions have come in through the computer since I've been talking away here. Does pediatric Crohn's indicate that a patient will have a more severe course of disease? Not necessarily. Um, so the, uh, you have more time in which to develop uh, the complications from Crohn's disease in particular, like strictures and fistulas. Um, but it's actually, it can be difficult to predict what the course of disease is um, long term. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll say I'm not an expert on pediatrics. Um, but it does seem that in my adult populations, particularly with ulcerative colitis, once patients have been in stable remission for 10, 20 years, it seems almost like the disease kind of burns itself out and becomes relatively easy to control at that point. And so I would say the, the earlier your onset is, by the time you get to my clinic, the longer you have had disease. And so I actually see people with fairly early onset IBD who um, have a, a fairly stable course uh, by the time they show up in my clinic. Um, so here's uh, a patient asking for some clinical advice. I'm in clinical remission from moderate distal ulcerative colitis and I'm taking mesalamine. Would you advise tapering slowly off the meds? I have already stopped the suppository and I'm watching what I eat. A modified SCD diet works well for me. What would the tapering look like? Um, I generally don't recommend that people stop uh, amino salicylates for ulcerative colitis because not only do these drugs work very safely and reasonably effectively uh, for long-term maintenance uh, for ulcerative colitis, but there is some data to suggest that they may also help prevent colon cancer. A patient with ulcerative colitis, unless it's limited just to the rectum, what we call proctitis, patients with ulcerative colitis are eventually, over the course of their lives, going to have a higher incidence of developing colon cancer than everybody else. So um, we can cut that risk. Some, some reports say by as much as twofold if you continue taking at least 1.6 grams a day of mesalamine indefinitely. Um, now, rectal therapies are no fun, and so um, I, if you've already stopped the suppository and, and are doing fine, then I would say that's fine. Usually when I, I if somebody has um, more than proctitis, I'll usually use the enema of mesalamine, and I am not terribly successful at convincing people to do that for more than about a month. Um, it's perfectly safe if you want to use it long term, but it's, it's just a difficult therapy to, to maintain indefinitely. So I usually tell people, try it for at least a month, see if you can get yourself under control, and if you can, then we can switch you over to or, or drop the enema and maintain you on an oral therapy of mesalamine. 
And I will typically start people at 4.8 grams a day, depending on what type of mesalamine you're using, the ALDA or Asicol or, or what, that, that'll be a different number of pills. It'll be a lot of pills um, because you need a fair amount of volume to get that much mesalamine to coat your colon. Um, but after six months of deep remission, I usually tell people they can drop down to about 2.4 grams a day. And that's where I typically leave them to try and maintain remission indefinitely. If they're one of these cases I mentioned earlier where they've been in deep remission for decades and the disease is kind of burned out, at that point I might drop them to 1.6 grams a day just to prevent colon cancer. Um, but I typically don't recommend coming completely off the medication. There really isn't a downside to, to taking them in terms of your health. Um, and SCD is um, something that is, is much discussed, but there's actually not been a lot of research to, um, to, to prove that it can do as much as, as a mesalamine type drug can. Now granted, it's much easier to do a trial of a drug like mesalamine where you can make a perfectly good placebo. You can't do that with a diet. Um, there is some pediatric data that looks like in kids, maybe the SCD uh, has uh, some efficacy, but in controlled trials, um, well, there just aren't any um, that that I think are, are very convincing for SCD. Also, I'm biased because the patients who can control themselves well on SCD don't show up in my clinic, so I only see the people for whom SCD doesn't work, um, with the exception of a friend of mine who happens to be one of the nurses I work with and see every day who did great on SCD for years. Um, and so, uh, but I guess if she wasn't my nurse, I would never have met her. So my personal experience is, unfortunately, I, I am biased by seeing predominantly the people who don't do well on SCD by itself. Um, let's see. Somebody just wrote that they can't hear me anymore. Hmm. Well, hopefully that's not true. I still see my microphone indicator lighting up. Um, somebody asked, is balsalazide in these class of drugs that prevent colon cancer? Yes. So it is called an amino salicylate. The amino salicylates are in order of popularity, um, mesalamine, sulfosalazine, balsalazide, and olsalazine. Um, and so, yeah, balsalazide is, is largely equivalent to mesalamine, very similar drugs. Um, and they come in many, many different pr proprietary names like Canasa is the enema, Rolas is the, sorry, Canasa is the suppository, Rolas is the enema. There's Asicol, uh, Pentassa, Lialda, Aprizo, Colazol, um, I'm probably forgetting a few, but they, they've been manufactured in several different delivery vehicles, um, but they're all basically the same type of drug, and they're salicylates, which means they're loosely related to aspirin. They also are poorly absorbed through the colon, and as a consequence, they're kind of like skin cream for your colon. They don't really get into your bloodstream very much, which is why they're so safe. Um, so uh, the the first the guy the, uh, the the person I know who uh, sent us the first question sent another question saying, do you see any difference in successful response rates to biologics based on age? For example, do patients who start taking Remicade as children versus when they're adults respond better to the drug? Maybe because their immune systems aren't fully developed yet and have time to tolerate the biologic. That's actually a really interesting observation because there is evidence that the rate of response in, in, to anti-TNF therapy in pediatrics is much higher than it is in adults. So in adults, typically clinical trials looking at anti-TNF therapy usually see about a 65-ish percent response rate. So about two-thirds of the patients in adults will respond. There are some trials in pediatrics that see a 90 percent response rate with anti-TNFs. And perhaps you're absolutely right that because the bulk of the immune cells are naive in children and are not as grown up and experienced and able to form a coherent army to attack the foreign molecule, that might explain why you see a, a better response. Having said that, the rate at which we have detectable antibodies to TNFs is only about 25, about 20 percent. And so it doesn't explain the whole 35 percent uh, lack of response. So. It may also have to do with the fact that children necessarily haven't had inflammatory bowel disease as long. Adults, um, it's hard to know how long an adult has had inflammatory bowel disease because a lot of times the, the symptoms are kind of smoldering away subclinically for years 
before they ever get bad enough for somebody to get a colonoscopy and get a formal diagnosis. So it may be that the immune system has moved on and it's set up shop and it's much more tenacious by the time an adult presents. Whereas if, if a two-year-old shows up with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you know by definition that that child has not had inflammatory bowel disease for more than two years. Um, so whether it's the duration of the disease or the naivete of the, of the immune system uh, is really unclear, but I think that's an interesting idea. Um, probably would be a good research question. Um, so let's see. Uh, So somebody asked, is the higher incidence of colon cancer in IBD patients caused by the mechanical physical damage or is it rooted in the genetics and immunological matrix? Um, I don't think it's genetics um, because um, we don't see, so a lot of the genes that show up in the, the, the IBD studies are not genes that have shown up in colon cancer risk genes. There are genetic uh, defects that are closely associated with colon cancer, but none of them are highlighted in the genetic studies that uh, showed up in IBD. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by immunological matrix, but the immune system uh, presumably does have a role in uh, facilitating colon cancer and IBD, and it could be that it's it's distracted. That one of the roles of the immune system, uh, I kind of briefly glanced on like with with killer T cells is that it does help prevent cancer by killing off cells as they turn into tumors. And if your immune system is preoccupied with fighting gut bacteria, harmless gut bacteria, it may be that, particularly in the colon, it's too distracted to do an effective job fighting what it needs to fight, namely cancer cells. Um, so that's one possibility. It could also be that a lot of the neutrophils that uh, are drive the inflammatory process and inflammatory bowel disease put out a lot of what are called reactive oxygen species that do a lot of damage to DNA. And it could be that over time that damaged DNA uh, can turn into what are called oncogenes, genetic changes that, that allow cancers to occur. Or it could be simply that because there's this ongoing damage and rebuilding constantly happening your entire life in the colon, that basically the, the the, the lining of the colon, the epithelium is dancing as fast as it can, trying to keep up with the inflammation, and uh, it, it makes a mistake every now and then. And as those cells divide and divide, you know, 10, 20 times more over the course of your life than they would in somebody without IBD, that there's more chances for them to make mistakes, and uh, those mistakes can translate into cancer cells sometimes. But I don't think we really know how cancer happens in inflammatory bowel disease, except that at least morphologically it looks rather different at its outset than in patients without IBD because it doesn't start out as a polyp. It makes it much harder for us as gastroenterologists to screen for it. It requires a lot of biopsies looking for a change called dysplasia as opposed to just trying to find a, a visible bump and remove it as a polyp. Um, let's see. In Europe, national therapy is considered a first line, or nutritional therapy is considered a first line of defense against IBD. Why is this not followed in the United States? Um, well, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess partly because there, it's not as clear what the right answer is in terms of trying to recommend a nutritional therapy. Um, different people seem to have different responses to their diet so that if you you can't give somebody one diet and say this is what's going to make you better I generally tell people to pay attention to what they eat and keep a food diary and track their symptoms something like the GI Buddy app that you can download from the CCFA's website is an excellent way to keep track of how your symptoms correspond to what you eat but what I've seen in my patient population is that there are tremendous differences from person to person in terms of what's considered a, a, a good diet for their IBD. So what one patient thinks is wonderful for them, another patient thinks is absolutely terrible. So I'm kind of afraid to sort of come up with a menu for IBD and tell people this is what you should be eating. I do recommend that people watch what they eat and pay attention, but beyond that, I think patients kind of have to be their own scientist. Um, also, there isn't really a lot of data out there. Probably as a consequence of this variability from person to person. Um, it's been too hard to make sense of the heterogeneity to, to determine if certain diets are better 
or worse for IBD than others. Um, it's certainly a lot easier to be homogeneous about a medical therapy and have a single recommendation and know what you're talking about when you're discussing with the patient because the clinical trials uh, that have been done with the available uh, pharmacologic agents are, are uh, very clear about how the, the patients were treated and give us a, a roadmap in terms of how to recommend appropriate therapy for a patient. Um, plus, uh, you don't really need a doctor to pursue dietary therapy. It's not a prescription. Um, and uh, I think it's one of the reasons why it's so important to know as much as you can about IBD and about your own body and pay attention to what you eat because it's a situation where a doctor is going to do a little more than cheerlead you in your efforts to control your own IBD. Um, I, I, as a physician, I feel like I'm relatively powerless when I try to employ nutritional therapies as a first line of defense against IBD. Um, let's see, getting back to some of the questions that came in before the talk. Um, the only cure for this disease is the removal of your colon, must be ulcerative colitis. In the future, do you think we will be able to discover a cure other than colon removal or drug therapies like biologics or immune suppressants? Um, I wouldn't be doing IBD research if I didn't think that a cure was a realistic possibility. Um, and I did mention towards the end of the talk that allogeneic stem cell transplant has given us a glimpse of what a cure could look like. With a 10% mortality, I don't think it's a very viable option for the vast majority of Crohn's patients at present, but if we can refine what the beneficial aspects of allogeneic transplant are and try to separate them from what the potentially toxic or fatal aspects of, of stem cell transplant are for IBD, uh, we may be able to get to a point where there, there's more equipoise between the, the safety and the efficacy of, of uh, replacing the immune system. I also think that there may be a role for gene therapy in the near future. I know it, it went out of fashion for a long time, but given that a lot of the biopharmaceuticals that we're using now are in fact gene products, they're proteins that are made by recombinant DNA in a cell line, if there were a way to introduce those very same genes into a patient, they could turn into their own drug factory. And um, if there were a way to, to do it safely so that they don't over-suppress the immune system and you can, you can control how much uh, immune suppression you, you have at any given time, that may actually be a viable treatment option. Um, the problem is that most of these drugs are proprietary, so um, you would have a hard time convincing the manufacturer of an agent to uh, license its product uh, for a curative measure that would put them out of business. Um, so I, I don't know how viable that would be. Plus, there are a lot of concerns about the potential for gene therapy to have a lot of toxicity associated with it, much like stem cell transplantation. Um, but I'm still very optimistic that uh, a cure is not an unattainable goal within uh, our lifetime uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, Somebody asked, has research found that individuals with Crohn's disease have overactive immune systems or specific deficits in their immune system? And I think somebody else also asked if, uh, if the Crohn's disease is a, a, an immune defect or immunodeficiency. Um, it's probably more on the overactive spectrum than the uh, defect spectrum. There's probably a, a broken piece of regulation here somewhere, something that is not restoring order to the immune system is not controlling it because what we see is more activated cells, more proliferating cells, more of those immune hormones called cytokines being made in patients with IBD than patients without. Um, so in general, the immune system is hyperactive and overactive, particularly while you're having a flare. Um, it is not an immunodeficiency. And somebody asked a question about how you boost your immune system. In IBD, the last thing you would want to do is boost your immune system. Um, because uh, we actually use immunosuppression and turn down the immune system as a primary mode of treatment. Now, if you could specifically boost the immune system, turn up the things you need your immune system to do to protect you while not turning up the parts of your immune system that drive the inflammatory process of IBD, that would be great. But the only way we really know how to do that right now is through vaccination. And that's why we are recommending so much, especially this time of year, that all IBD patients get a flu shot 
And the CDC has recommended that if you're, you're on or likely to start an immunosuppressant medication, you should really get a pneumonia vaccine too, even if you're under the age of 60 for whom these are normally recommended. Um, so vaccination is probably the, the only safe way to boost your immune system without simultaneously triggering, triggering a lot of inflammation that could drive Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, although I do have patients who complain that the, the vaccines make the, their colitis feel worse. Um, and so there may actually be a little bit of cross-reactivity in a few individuals. Um, so let's see, a couple more questions just came through the internet here. Do you see a time when every IBD patient will have their genome sequenced and analyzed and compared to the population as a whole to better elucidate genetic causes and or relationships? And how helpful do you think this would be? Um, I should point out that the genetic uh, disturbances that have been associated with IBD have what's called an odds ratio. Um, in other words, uh, how much does having this, this particular sequence in your DNA make you more likely to have IBD than, than somebody who doesn't have it? Most of these odds ratios are less than two. So like one point, sometimes 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4, really low odds ratios. So a single genetic defect does almost nothing to tell you whether or not you're, you're going to get a disease that affects well below 1% of the general population. Um, and so far, when people have taken this huge amount of information that now exists on tens of thousands of individuals with IBD and tried to correlate it with um, clinical responses, it hasn't really proved a, proven to show a magic combination of genes that tells us, yes, your IBD is going to do that, or you fall into this category or that category. Um, so although there are actually companies out there right now who will um, sequence the, the variable parts of your, in, of your entire genetics or genome uh, for a fee, sometimes as low as $100, I don't think any of us know what to do with that information. And I'm not optimistic that the genetic data alone is really going to tell us very much because I think so much of what drives the immune response is this random event that occurs in T cells. And remember, I mentioned that the T cells are unique in their DNA. So that the T cell receptor that's driving the inflammatory response is going to be unique to only those T cells. That are, that are in there driving the immune response, and you're not going to see that from a whole genome sequencing test. Can you address extraintestinal manifestations such as joint pain and swelling? What medications do you suggest? I am having swelling in my thumb and big toe joints. Should I see a rheumatologist to find out what type of arthritis I may be developing? I am currently taking Lialda. The big question there is what is your bowel doing? Because most of the extraintestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease are a direct extension of the bowel inflammation and inflammatory bowel disease. So if you have colitis and you get arthritis um, when your colitis flares, you, you probably don't need a rheumatologist yet. The, the job is still very much in the gastroenterology clinic. And so if your gastroenterologist can get your colitis completely under control where you're not having diarrhea, your, your colon looks great, your, your fecal tests show no signs of inflammation, and you still have arthritis, then I think you need a rheumatologist because the gastroenterologist has done everything they can to fix their organ, and there's still a problem. And that means that this is probably a manifestation that goes beyond um, the inflammatory bowel disease itself. But up until the point that the bowel is actually controlled, it's not clear that you need to go to a specialist, the exception being eye problems. If you develop the eye compl complications of inflammatory bowel disease called um, uveitis or iritis, you should not waste time seeing an ophthalmologist. Some of those can, uh, if they get bad enough, result in blindness, and you may not have time to get your bowel under control. So I take eye complaints very seriously and say that you have to go see your eye doctor right away. This, this can't wait for your gastroenterologist to fix your colon. Another issue is that there are a couple of diseases that run a course that's completely independent to uh, the inflammation in the gut. They're more associated with inflammatory bowel disease than clearly caused by inflammatory bowel disease because you can make the gut do very well with medications and these other organs will just continue on their course um, with no interruption in the disease process. The main ones are ankylosing spondylitis. This is an inflammatory arthritis that involves the spine going down into the back part of the pelvis called the sacroiliac joints. And then the other one is sclerosing cholangitis. It's an inflammatory condition of the liver where the bile ducts get obstructed. Those two diseases will, uh, will not get better in response to gastrointestinal therapy, um, in particular drugs like Lialda that clearly only work on the GI tract are not going to help sclerosing cholangitis. 
or ankylosing spondylitis. So if you have ankylosing spondylitis, you need a guest and, and IVD, you need a gastroenterologist and a rheumatologist. If you have sclerosing cholangitis and uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you either need a gastroenterologist who's much better at liver disease than I am, or you need a gastroenterologist who is very comfortable with IVD and a hepatologist who's very comfortable with liver uh, inflammatory liver diseases. Um, so that typically involves co-management for those two conditions. Most of the other conditions, though, will respond to uh, therapy for the gut. And arthritis is not like the eye complaints. It's something that uh, you have time to get the gut under control. Let's see if I missed a few here. Every two to three years of having a colonoscopy, they occasionally find polyps. Is this a big concern or a normal thing that occurs? Well, it depends on what kinds of polyps and how old you are. So it's not uncommon for patients with chronic colitis, chronic inflammation of the colon to develop what are called inflammatory pseudopolyps, where over time when you have constant inflammation and regeneration of the, the bowel lining, the mucosa, it tends to lump up into these folds that have kind of a distinctive look to them, but they they can look a lot like a conventional colon polyp, and because we're trained to, to take polyps off, uh, we tend to remove them, if, but a lot of times there's too many to remove. These are totally benign. They have absolutely nothing to do with anything, except they make it really hard to find real polyps if there are hundreds of them, which there often are. Uh, so inflammatory pseudopolyps are not a, a risk factor for cancer. They just make it really hard to screen you for colon cancer um, through a colonoscope. If you develop what are called adenomas, the type of polyp that in people without IBD are normally associated with colon cancer, um, it depends on how old you are. Adenomas generally don't occur very commonly under the age of 50, which is why we don't screen for them until you're over 50 years old. So if you're in your 20s and you have adenomas in your colon, then you probably do need to get colonoscopies um, pretty frequently. And there, you may want to get genetic testing and take a good uh, thorough family history because that's unusual for someone in their 20s to have a lot of adenomas. Um, the older you get, the more ordinary it is, and IBD patients can develop garden variety polyps in their colons just like people without IBD. So if you're 60 and you've got a couple of polyps, you're entitled to that. That doesn't mean that you're really at increased risk for, for colon cancer, but sometimes you'll see something like a polyp show up in a patient with inflammatory bowel disease where if we take biopsies down around the normal looking mucosa nearby the polyp, we will see what's called dysplasia or changes that look like colon cancer. In that case, uh, there is a pretty high chance that you could develop colon cancer. Um, so your question is actually pretty complicated. Um, and uh, I can't really offer a, a single answer that will, will uh, satisfy everybody in terms of whether or not you need to worry about polyps and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, you do mention that you get a colonoscopy every two to three years. Um, and uh, there are, there's somewhat of a consensus in terms of, of um, when IVD patients should get uh, screening colonoscopies or surveillance colonoscopies to look for colon cancer. Uh, it's clearer for ulcerative colitis than Crohn's. If, if you have ulcerative colitis, the big question is how much of the colon is involved. If it's just the rectum, ulcerative proctitis, you don't actually need colonoscopy specifically for colon cancer screening um, until you turn 50, just like everyone else. Um, if you have ulcerative colitis that's limited to the left side of the colon, you don't need to start getting colonoscopies for cancer screening until you've had disease for uh, 15 years, and you only need to get the colonoscopy every two to three years. If the entire colon is involved, we recommend that you uh, get a colonoscopy uh, eight to 10 years after your initial diagnosis and then every year thereafter. If you have a condition called sclerosing cholangitis, that liver condition I mentioned, uh, your risk of colon cancer is actually higher than anybody else with IBD. And so you should start getting a colonoscopy every year starting right away. As soon as we know you have both colitis and PSC, you should get annual colonoscopies. In Crohn's disease, it's less clear. If less than 30% of the colon is involved, if less than 30% of the surface area of the lining of the colon is involved with Crohn's disease, it's not clear that you need any sort of colon cancer screening. But if more than 30% is involved, we usually treat it like ulcerative colitis and just sort of guess, is this akin to the entire colon being involved? Is this akin to uh, just half the colon being involved? 
uh, and then uh, mirror the recommendations that I just said. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't. What's that? Oh, here it says, by nutrition therapy, I was referring to the use of peptide supplemental nutrition. So this is somebody who asked earlier about um, nutritional therapy in Europe. Um, I've never actually seen peptide supplemental nutrition used in an adult population. There was a bunch of data that came out in pediatrics using an elemental diet um, in children. It was, it was actually fairly effective, but the children usually had to have a nasogastric tube because it was such an unpalatable diet. Um, I've not really seen that that effort replicated in adults, and I think most people would rather take a medication than have a nasogastric tube. Um, but no, I have to I have to plead ignorance here that uh, peptide supplemental nutrition is something that I know very little about and uh, have not actually seen in practice in the United States. So if it's common in Europe, uh, uh, I think uh, I, I just learned something tonight. Um, yeah, that's news to me. Okay. Let me go back to a couple more of the questions that came in before we started talking. Um, uh, why does the disease appear to be more prevalent in northern climates? Does the sun or vitamin D have any relation? Are there links to other autoimmune diseases such as arthritis and multiple sclerosis? And if so, why? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it is true that the inflammatory bowel disease tends to be more common the closer you get to the poles provided uh, you're in a genetically susceptible population. So Europeans seem to, and so Europeans and Ashkenazi Jews seem to be, uh, have the, the genetic background with the highest likelihood of developing inflammatory bowel disease. So countries where that's a predominance of the population like Canada and New Zealand that are close to um, the, the poles have, have the highest incidence of inflammatory bowel disease on earth. And even here in the United States, uh, here in Seattle where I'm sitting right now is a uh, uh, higher incidence of inflammatory bowel disease than most of, most of the United States. And it's not because we're colder than any place else, but we do get less sunlight in general um, between our, our short winter days and the amount of cloud cover we get. So it might actually have to do with sunlight and vitamin D. And there was a study that looked at all the different counties in France or I guess we, they call them provinces, um, and looked at the meteorolog meteorologic records and lined them up with the uh, incidence rates for, for inflammatory bowel disease, and they actually saw a really nice correlation between how much sunlight they got and uh, how likely they were to, or not likely they were to, to get inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so there's a lot of correlative data, epidemiologic data, to suggest that sunlight exposure plays a role. Um, and vitamin D may play a role too. Uh, there tends to be a lower uh, level of vitamin D in a lot of Crohn's patients, but that may simply be because the terminal ileum where vitamin D is absorbed is often diseased in Crohn's disease, and so it's harder for your GI tract to get enough vitamin D into your body. So here's a situation where it's quite difficult to tease out cause and effect based upon at least the vitamin D level. How vitamin D and sunlight may actually interact with the immune system is unclear. Uh, there are uh, certain retinoids, um, certain uh, micronutrients that do seem to uh, impact the development of immune cells in the lymph nodes that drain from the mucosa. So there's something called all transretinoic acid that um, can drive uh, CD103 positive dendritic cells to convert uh, lymph node naive T cells into more of a regulatory type than a pro-inflammatory effector type and so that's been held out as a situation where a vitamin can can uh, drive an immune response in one direction or the other. There's also this new class of immune cells I'm really interested in called mate cells that seem to respond to uh, riboflavin metabolites that are created by the bacteria in your gut but so far there's only one paper looking at them in inflammatory bowel disease with uh, almost no information about the gut. So. Um, it's an area that I think needs further exploration. But here I'm, I'm talking more about vitamins than, than sunlight. I don't know why sunlight has an effect. Um, there was some data, I think, in stem cell transplant that said that PUVA, the, the UV light, um, could actually uh, 
or what was it? What did they call it? It was some sort of a UV light machine that, that seemed to increase the fraction of cells in the bloodstream that were regulatory T cells. Um, so it may be that it somehow skews your, your immune system towards a more regulatory characteristic. Um, there have been genetic links between inflammatory bowel disease and other autoimmune diseases. Um, uh, there are a, a number of genes like uh, PTPN2 that are common to both type 1 diabetes and uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, one of the major interests in the Benaroy Research Institute where I currently work, uh, largely the lab of Jane Buckner, is in trying to compare the immune systems of patients with these different diseases and look at the different genes that they have in common or different and see how that affects the, the characteristics of their circulating immune cells. So she has a major uh, grant from the NIH to study that. And so that's work that's currently ongoing in our lab. Um, but we don't really know how the genes that are common between these, these different autoimmune conditions um, actually cause the immune system to, to result in one disease or the other. Um, but you're right, it does seem that uh, arthritis and multiple sclerosis are likewise uh, more common the farther you get from the equator. So I think we're, we're reaching the end of our time here. It's now 7.31 p.m. I'm about a minute over. And so I want to thank everybody who's held out here towards the, to the bitter end, and I appreciate all your great questions. There's some really thoughtful ideas that were, were put out there tonight. And I hope that everybody learned at least a little something about the immune system and the gut. And uh, I hope I was able to convey some of uh, my excitement and passion for why I think this is such an important area for research. And again, offer my thanks to the CCFA for making tonight's uh, talk possible, and more importantly, uh, for making this type of research possible and uh, committing to the type of research that's really necessary to move forward towards a, a real cure for inflammatory bowel disease. So thank you all very much and uh, good night.